Hello and welcome to Golden Droplets episode number 15. I'm your host, Ricardo Valls, a PGO registered in the province of Ontario, Canada, and also the founder and president of Alge Consultant with over 36 years of international experience. In today's episode, we will continue our mini series of unusual sampling techniques. And today we will be discussing a hybrid of sampling method. And we will be talking about geochemistry. As you probably know, we can group geochemical sampling or geochemical anomalies in three groups like um, alluvials that get transported very much, uh, alluvials and alluvials that are moderated sample like soil sampling, and in situ anomalies like beta biochemistry when you sample the rock. The applications and the usefulness of each of these anomalies is clear. When you're doing regional exploration, you will go with the stream sediment and heavy mineral concentrates by sampling the banks of the river, also hydrobiochemistry or biobiochemistry. These are methods that cover large area with a relatively rare grid of sampling. For example, uh, in if you're doing a survey of one to 50,000, you will get about four to six string sediment meters, and no more than two heavy mineral concentrates per square kilometer. That would be enough for a scale of one to 50,000. Now, and heavy mineral concentrates, they are both taken from the active sediments from a stream. Uh, although you can actually take heavy mineral concentrate from any place in any any rock, any place. These include paleoplacers, these include just soil. This includes, for example, uh, crushing a rock down to the powder and doing a, a pan, a heavy mineral concentrate. So heavy mineral concentrate is more ubiquitous. Now, heavy mineral concentrates allows you to uh, an initial volume of material down to several grams. Thus, enriching the sample sometimes 500 times, a thousand times. When you're doing this, you are increasing the possibility of detecting anomalies of elements that are not that abundant, like or diamonds, etc. So the heavy mineral concentrate, you start by taking a constant. It could be constant. And also it's very important that you take the sample from a site that Mother Nature have accumulated the heavy fractions. And in rivers, this is very simple to determine. It's only a function of the speed of the water. And what you're looking at is places where the stream was going fast and then there was a curve, a meander, or a, an obstacle in the river, and the velocity of the water reduced suddenly Thus, the heavy fraction falls. So you get the sample from before the obstruction. Or, you know, the river makes several meanders. From one part, it excavates, and the other part, it deposits. Well, you take the sample from the deposit part. But the most important, the sample must be representative from the, the site. Then uh, the process is, it takes several steps. You need to weigh the sample, you need to sieve it, you need to describe the macro fraction, and then at the end, you start panning. Now, the actual panning, I know really good. They will pan a 10 liter material down to, you know, the three, five grams of black concentrate in five minutes or three minutes. I have seen panners that are able to pan using not a panner, but just a dish or a shovel. So there are people that are really, really extremely good at panning. But 
even those people that are the exception would require time to process the the concentrate and that is the reason why i believe heavy mineral concentrate is not a common method applied for exploration it's much faster to get to the stream put your hand in a plastic bag grab a handful of material from the first terrace river and you have your stream sample and that is sent to the lab the lab dries it and does spectral analysis or a fire assays and you get your result in the case of the heavy mineral concentrates while doing once you finish doing your panning you can separate different fractions like you can separate the magnetic fraction the electromagnetic fraction and each of these four fractions can be studied under the microscope and sent to the lab for acid so you get four samples per site again as you can see i'm a big fan of the heavy mineral concentrate but the problem remains it takes too much time well i think i found a solution for this and this will be today's episode i hope you like it Usually, more than 90% of that material is just waste. I mean, it doesn't contain any information. So any technique that we can use to concentrate the heavy minerals, which are usually the ones that carry the mineralization, will help us get better results. We are enriching the sample on purpose, which is what we need to get good results from the lab. So, normally, people do the panning. And for the pan, by the way, I didn't explain the first time. If you're going to do panning normally, instead of the little cup, you have a bucket of 10 liters. And the rest is the same. So, But it is important to always have the same weight. Sorry, the same volume. Okay? So 10 liters, you're doing a normal pan, something like this, that you later find out how many good centimeters are here. So, and you need a balance. So you fill this material, you weight it, you got volume by weight if you the density of the rock. And even that may tell you immediately if there is something good or not because the more dense the sample, the most important thing. Actually, there is another thing that I forgot to explain. So it's good that the camera turned off. Okay. Where do you get the sample in the river? It, this is a mechanical anomaly. So you need to apply a little bit of physics. You need to, to sample in places where the water in the stream accelerates but not too much accelerates enough to wash the light fraction or stops enough so the heavy fraction will fall so good places and an obstruction in the river like a tree falling tree that is usually one of the best places you pick it up before the water i mean the, the trunk is here the water goes here you get it from here so that is one of the best. The second thing to know is that the river always do meanders. And from one side, he erodes. There, for example, is eroding there. And then it deposits on the opposite side. So you take the sample from here. This is a good sample. Within the area, try to find out where you see rocks like this. Okay. And I know this, this is a problem because all these rocks need to be thrown away. But here, in this piece here, is your best concentrate of heavy minerals in the whole size here. So you see, there, wherever you see rocks, that is where you're going to take the sample. You see over here, there is nothing. Okay, so those are the, the, imp the important things. So, okay, let's go back. So as I mentioned... We're gonna, this you do it in the field, but because we have this sample taken before, we will fill this up. You hit it like that, so it will, okay. So, that is your sample. So the next thing, you weigh this. 
and you know how much it weighs. Then you take, usually take something a little bit bigger, longer at least, this is too square. So, you take a sieve, a sieve of number four, which is about half an inch, okay? So you can throw away all the big rocks. So, there is the sieve, okay, the invisible sieve. And then we need to make sure that this, we're going to take a couple of spoons, spoons that this sample is representative of the meter you sample in the wall. So we need to homogenize this extremely well and then do a, a quarters. So this I really discovered like a couple of months ago. A very easy way to do the, the homogenization is just grab this thing and then you pull it up. You need to put it up, you need to put it up, no, sorry, sorry, so that, you need to do that so it will move, okay, okay, now we do the same, but on this side, be hard, be hard, it, it, it must rotate, it cannot slide, it needs to rotate, yeah. okay, so you need to do like this, no, it's a brisk movement, like that, okay? This one. This one. Ah, you got it. You got it. Okay, perfect. So now that it's well homogenized, we just distribute it. Make a quarter. By the way, I'm doing something really bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And you just throw away two parts. This is your sample. Okay, so we're going to take the sample from here. So, for that, we take a condom. Ah, actually, this is the box. Power play. This is the okay. one you do. Gonna okay. Because all the other one has some forms, strange forms, and, and smells and stuff like that. We don't need that. So you just fill the, the condom with water from the river. Come on. And as I said before, the best one if, if it, it doesn't have any oil on it. But if not, we work with what we have. Now that we have the condom with about half the weight of water, we just add the spoons on here. I will let you do complete the full one from the from the side for yourself. Now remember the tip. Grab the tip. use this spoon anymore in my pockets. <laughs> you can put it. Actually it's amazing is it takes enough material. So if you see there is no sorting there. They are just yeah. like they put so we Grab the condom here, and we're not gonna do this first moving, and then I'm gonna lift the the tip. And we're gonna do a vertical movement. Practice safe yolish. <laughs> so 10 seconds, 15 seconds, really, you don't need too much. And when you finish, you will see that all the heavy fraction are concentrated right here. And all this is like light material, clay, etc. So basically by 50% minimum, you have concentrated the sample. 
with the thing that you need. Now, to get the, the sample, you just grab it from where you want to get. Sometimes you are interested in the really, really heavy ones, you just grab this, the little bit. Okay? If not, but at this exploration, now grab all the whole thing, throw it away, and that is yours. some material here. Usually the material that you put here is the material that has been seed. This is just an experiment. So once you put it, see that I have the, the tip pressed, okay? Then you just close these things, okay? And you release the pit, the tip, and you start doing this motion, okay? Five seconds, no more. Now come closer and you will see your panel going down. Come here. As you can see, the heavy fraction is down here, the light fraction is here, and the clay is up there. Oh yes. So what you do, it depends. If you are only interested in, heavy, in the heavy, you just grab this bit here and throw away the rest. Okay. Usually I would recommend to take more, to take like this bit here so what you do just drop it and that's this is your sample come on so so easy <laughs> fast yeah that's your sample. and it is now this thing goes into an envelope that i will show you now how you how you do it and when it is dry you can separate the magnetic fraction using a, a magnet you can even do that partially here in the in the condom you can just pass the magnet and put the magnetic fraction on the top and then throw it away. But it's easier to wait when it's, it's dry and you do the separation. So that, my friend, is your pan sample. You put it a number or whatever and that's it. Stop recording. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to explain the use of a condom to obtain a heavy mineral concentrate right in the field if we want to do it. First we take a condom that has no oil, must be important, then we pour in the material. In this case it was a material taken from a, a creek, a dry creek. It's composed of you know all the fractions. So we previously filled the condom with water then we add the material using a spoon it can be done directly in the field. Once we have enough material, we just close it here and start shaking the condom. We can do a little bit of manual mixing. And in just a few seconds, we will have a perfect separation of all the fines and all the heavy grains. We throw away this part, the, the, the fine fraction, we just select this thing here and pour it and then this is the material that we're going to send to the lab that we put on a paper and we just, we could send the, the condom to them, it's plastic so it's nothing, it will not alter the rock in any way, the assay in any way. The reason why it should not have oil is because if, if it had oil, it will stick to the to the condom. So this way, we have a heavy concentrate. Very simple to do. If we dry this and use a magnetic separator, we could also have a magnetic fraction separate. Okay, now that we have the, the sample that we concentrated in the field, I want to show you some of the preparations that you can do at the office to study your material. So 
I will show you how to do a magnetic separation and a sort of a heavy or gravity separation not using any liquid. So let's assume this is a sample and you are going to need something like this binder. Black color is better because if you have gold it will look much better here. So let's say that this is a sample. Put it as close as possible to this side of the binder, the top side. So you can find this called a gold separator, which is an improper name because gold is not magnetic, but this is a, sep a magnetic separator. Put your magnet on top of the material and then you pull this up and the material, the magnet goes up and the material will fall. I will show you. So you see how it got the magnetic fraction there. See it in detail. And now I just put it here. That's it. Now, if you don't have one of this, there is a simple method of doing. One sec. As I was saying, if you don't have a magnetic separator, just find a normal magnet, like a fridge magnet, you know, and a piece of paper. And you put the magnet inside the piece of paper. And again, you see, you pick up the magnetic fraction. Okay, and then you just take the magnet out and the material falls. So I'm going to finish taking the rest of the magnetic fraction and what if we sampled when we were doing the panning we went down to the black material, the black sand, this here was composed both mostly of heavy, heavy fraction and the magnetic fraction and the electromagnetic fraction. So we separated the magnetic fraction. Now, the equipment that we're gonna need to separate the heavy fraction, uh, not using any liquid, is a simple straw. Uh, you take a straw and for a little time, you take a pin and you press the end of the straw. So when you're gonna be, you're gonna be blowing, okay? So the air will go out like a stream. This way, you're gonna blow the material and because the gold is much heavier than the rest of the, of the sample, the gold will remain in the binder. And because the binder is black, it will be very easy to spot. So you just need to learn, you know, this, this how strong you need to blow, but with time you get practice to it. So we start. So you said there, that is a little grain of gold. So this is how you can use your straw to separate the gold grains or in general to blow away the light fraction. Now, the next step is, well, you can study this with the magnify lens, of course, but I will strongly recommend you to acquire a Dinolite microscope. Dinolite microscope, this little thing here, gets connected to the computer, and I will go and show you now how it looks like. And you get, well, in this model, you get even polarized light. You get a augmentation up to 250 times. You can use this dinner light microscope to study polished section, thin sections. Uh, you can take it into the field to observe the affinitic mass of a porphyry rock, etc. 
when I bought this model, it was about 200 Canadian dollars. Now it's about 400, 480. But anyway, it is much less than a normal microscope or binocular that will cost you in the thousands of dollars. To, uh, to buy this thing, you can go to Dinolite, D-I-N-O-L-I-T-E, or uh, as anything, anything that you will need in geology, you can go to Deakin, D-E-A-K-I-N. It's a geological store here in Vancouver, and they offer absolutely everything from hammers to microscopes. So uh, now let me show you how this microscope, microscope works in the computer. So this is Dino Capture, the software that allows you to link your Dino Light to the computer or a laptop or I, I believe that there will be soon a connection to your iPhone or your smartphone. So that will make Dino Light completely portable. Uh, as I mentioned, you can do uh, increase the size of the things up to 250 times and the software allows you to do multiple things like measuring uh, the size of a, of a grain, uh, taking photos, okay, so you should take a photo, click on this and you get a photo, uh, you can take a video too, a VGA, or a time lapse video. I will not take a video this time. You can measure the size of a grain. So that one will be 0 0.7 millimeters. You can do annotations. And all these uh, pictures can be then downloaded to your computer and you just move your sample around. Oh, look at that piece of galena there. See the, the shiny. So this microscope, portable microscope, will be a very useful tool for you in the field and in the office. My name is Sergio Troncoso and I work here at ACLABS in the Mineralogical Department and uh, I'm here just to show you some of our capabilities that we offer at ACLABS. Here we have a MLA quint, quint scan, um, quint is big and you can see that uh, we offer this machine uh, various types of mineralogical work. Uh, we can determine bulk mineralogy, uh, mineral identification, quantification. Uh, liberation, association, mineral association, and um, and so forth. This will be very beneficial for your uh, getting to know your ore or for processing uh, procedures for your for your plant. Um, we have uh, here our. This is what we mount the samples. These are polish sections. Uh, we can mount. Um, also thin sections that we can map um, and determine uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, very similar or better better than actually doing a petrographic study um, then we can also do a sprinkle mount for, for very uh, different types of material uh, as you can see um, that we have two machines uh, both an MLA and, and a quem scan and this is actually running some samples right now. Uh, here you can see in the monitor the actual uh, uh, place where we are actually the samples being analyzed is in a vacuum and the samples being analyzed as we speak. There are various uh, um, methods that 
this can be used for, like I said, for production, for exploration, for metal analysis, for anything that you want to determine uh, mineralogy uh, or determine mineral content of it. Uh, the detection limit for this machines are better than 0.1% uh, versus an XRD, which more is a tr traditional trace, uh, trace geochemistry or mineralogy where you know you're talking with detection limits but 1% to 3%. We also have we also have XRD as you can see. We have two XRD that we are able to analyze as well. The uh, to identify the mineral crystalline mineral phases of of samples and which could be used by itself or can be used in conjunction with the MLA as a quality check. It's uh, one of the key items for any of this is the sample preparation of the samples to ensure that your sample being analyzed is, is a representative of your sample and what you're trying to determine. So, um, Here's our sample preparation location. We actually, uh, it's, very, it's very important to, like I indicated to you before, to properly prepare the sample. Uh, one of the best way of doing sample preparation is to stage pulverize a desired um, particle size. And not to, that way you ensure not to over pulverize and to lose uh, mineral texture on the samples. Uh, and then you would run different polishing uh, procedures to mount that sample. You can, uh, by, by this method, like I said, uh, it is hopefully will help you with the, your processing or your exploration. And you can use, you know, you can actually correlate the mineralogy, what is obtained from here, to your geochemical analysis. All right, you can um, visit our website, www.aclabs.com and uh, go under geometallurgy and you'll find additional information in all the packages that we offer. Okay, thank you. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Tassos uh, Grammatikopoulos. I'm working for SGS in Lakeville, Ontario. I'd like to take this opportunity today to explain a little bit of the automated mineralogy tools that we've been using uh, in Lakeville and in SGS in general to help our clients uh, in uh, exploration of mineral processing. For acquirative uh, mineralogy, we're using uh, QuemScan and TMIX that we just acquired recently. I'll focus a little bit more on uh, the QuemScan that we've been using for the last uh, 20 years or so. So really the QuemScan is um, an automated SEM. The principle behind that is similar to all other uh, SEMs. That is um, an electro beam um, interacts with a mineral, excites X-rays and those X-rays are characteristic of the particular mineral. So if uh, we're dealing with uh, pyrite, then we'll see the, the peaks of iron and sulfur. And if we're dealing with helicopyrite, then we'll see peaks of copper, iron, and, and sulfur. So the ratios, we use the ratios of these um, elements to define the different minerals. So what what is the output of the QEM scan? There is a number of things, but it's not so much what we can generate uh, using QEM scan analysis, but as a lot of labs can do that, but it's mostly, our focus is mostly the use of the data, the utilization of the data and interpretation of the data. Uh, essentially, uh, one with the QEM scan can get uh, anything from model mineralogy, mineral mass to grain size, um, distribution, grades and recoveries, um, liberation and association of the minerals and so on. So what does the QEM scan do? The QEM scan collects the x-rays, measures the particles, and then we create these pseudo color images that we use to calculate the liberation, the association of the minerals, and we evaluate 
the textual sort of characteristics of uh, the orbs. This is uh, just to show you um, an example of um, uh, uh, the use of automated mineralogy in uh, in exploration. So the the left graph shows the distribution of uh, pyrite in red and halcopyrite um, across um, a number of uh, uh, drill holes, uh, assay reject samples, and the graph to the right shows the the changes in textures and model mineralogy. So one one can model these sort of parameters to um, to map a particular deposit either for alteration purposes or if um, you know one is looking to um, to track uh, the distribution of uh, the sulfides because they carry gold and so on. So very quickly, you know, I just want to, I always like these photographs because they, they, they're, they're, they're maps of uh, the drill cores on a mesoscopic scale and they tell you a story. Those, those photographs, uh, those images rather, are from uh, the Nechalacho or uh, Avalon's uh, deposit in Northwest Territory. And what we do here is we map um, a, a, a polish section of about 30 millimeters in diameter. And we can identify the different types of minerals and evaluate their distribution. Just a little bit of a, a different or a simplified view. The left graph shows, or the left image rather, shows um, the distribution of zircon in the gang minerals and a little bit of uh, alanite or rares rather that you don't see. That it can include alanite, monazite, basnazite, and so on. And the image to the right shows a completely different distribution with less zircon, but with a lot more of the rares. So we, we've been using this, um, this sort of images and, and mineralogical maps to, to evaluate uh, the variability of the textures, the ores, you know, across the deposit, um, along drill holes and so on. The same images can be used for different purposes. So one has to play with a lot of this data and parameters, um, but essentially, we use different factors such as the PSSA. I don't, I don't have much time to explain that over here now. Uh, there's papers out there, you know, to, uh, to that explain, um, you know, the different uh, functionalities and, and different parameters that we're using for QuemScan. But essentially, it shows you that um, a low PSSA um, shows uh, quite a bit of uh, coarse material, low and high PSSA, uh, very fine grain material. Of course, uh, things are not very, very simple uh, as they always look. One has to play around a little bit with the data and, uh, and, and make some uh, proper interpretations. Um, I'm going to show you a few slides um, from uh, a project that we recently, uh, recently did for the uh, for Heavy Mineral Sands project in uh, Southeast US. Um, I, we examine a number of samples from Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. That's why you see GA for Georgia, South, uh, SC for South Carolina, and, and NC for North Carolina. <clears throat> so we analyzed the samples uh, as received, and so we calculated the most important um, uh, heavy minerals. In this case, there was a little bit of monazite, um, rare synchicide, basnazite, a little bit of zircon and then some iron oxides, iron titanium oxides, and apatite. Um, one of the functionalities of the QEM scan is that it, you can extract really some powerful measurements. For example, in this case, um, I wanted to see the difference in the grain size between the different minerals and different samples. So I'm just showing an example of uh, cumulative grain size distribution of one of the samples. I was particularly interested in the zircon and monazite, of course, but for our purposes here, you can see the blue line uh, shows the monazite and the sort of dark red, the zircon. Um, so you can see that the zircon is uh, coarser and so than the monazite. And so the idea here is to evaluate the, the grain size of the minerals because it's critical for processing uh, purposes. So one of the I mentioned earlier one of the parameters that we uh, we we uh, extract from the QEM scan is the liberation of the mineral. So sometimes we have the analysis on a size by size fraction, sometimes on other sieve sample, maybe at a pH of 200 microns or 300 microns, and we can um, calculate the liberation of the association of the mineral. So you can see that the liberation of the zircon varies across 
the different samples. So imagine that you have quite a bit of variability in some of the sands or any other deposit. You can predict what might happen when you start processing this type of material from, uh, from the areas. So those are just uh, particle maps that allow us to look at visually a little bit better the association of uh, the zircon. And so this is this little uh, group here is just a free zircon. You can see zircon um, attached uh, to or locked in, in uh, uh, apatite, but also zircon attached or locked in, in quartz. And of course, unless you grind these grains, these zircon uh, particles w w we will not will not liberate, which is also very critical because we can calculate exactly how much of that zircon. Um, uh, population one liberate at this particular uh, grain size, let's say 200 microns. So what we did um, in this case, we upgraded um, the samples uh, using heavy media, heavy liquids. And so you can see that the upgrading factor is pretty good for a lot of these uh, minerals, especially ilmenite. Um, not, not so much for the, uh, the monazite. It's very erratic because the mass is, um, of, of the mineral is not is not a high, but nevertheless, it gives you an idea of um, of uh, the upgrading factor for uh, for the heavy minerals. And so then I rerun uh, some of the samples, the heavy fractions through the QEM scan to see what what is it that I'm getting at. Um, and so I can see that monazite is quite quite a lot higher than the trace minerals that I found earlier. You know, in the other sieve samples. Zircon is, is given quite a bit of uh, population and of course, ilmenite and rutile. So these mineral sands are not, uh, they have other minerals there, but those are the most economic uh, sort of uh, products. Um, you can, uh, we use the data for different purposes. Um, one of the, the things that we looked at was the roundness or the shape of the different uh, minerals. So this is the shape of the monazite. So we can classify these particles based on uh, their roundness and angularity and try to evaluate whether they are coming from long distance or you know short distances. And so we can trace possibly their provenance. We can go back to the source. But for metallurgical projects, when uh, things are really tough and you, one has multiple rare earth minerals, we don't know which mineral we recover and which mineral we lose in the tailings. We can calculate gray recovery curves based on their rare earth um, uh, grades or we can tackle a particular mineral. So instead of having rare earth grades, we could have monazite, for example, grades and recoveries. And so this is a, a little bit of a complex uh, graph. Um, it's not um, it's not easy to explain over a minute, but it, it shows the 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 grades and recoveries of uh, uh, from the QEMSCAN calculations and the actual metallurgical uh, uh, test work. So there are some differences, and we know why we have the differences for each particular case, uh, slimes involved and so on. Another powerful uh, method rather um, is, is the chemistry of the minerals, especially when we're dealing with multiple minerals and we're looking for trace elements um, such as uh, thorium, uranium and so on. So we, we tackle this sort of uh, work by doing um, uh, electro electro microprobe analysis of uh, monazite or alanide so we can calculate the distribution of uh, the different elements uh, thorium and uranium and, and some of these um, uh, deleterious sort of um, elements are very critical because they, they will affect the downstream process, um, not so much the mineral processing, you know, the flotation or the gravity, but the, the hydromet side and how, how the, the, the hydromet people will, will uh, approach, uh, you know, the cracking of these minerals to extract uh, the, the rare earths and, and, and sort of, um, uh, decouple them from uh, thorium and uranium. So uh, again, for exploration purposes, we can lose, uh, we can use the um, the monazite uh, chemistry to see if there, um, where they plot, um, if there are any differences. We we can enhance, you know, some of this uh, uh, some some of this population. But for exploration purposes and for the work that we did for uh, for this particular project, the mineral sands. Um, it, it, it's critical because it allows us to compare, you know, the, the different populations of monazite. And so the ultimate weapon, you know, in this case is when we have the, the, is to calculate the, the, the rare earth, uh, the rare earth uh, distribution. So when one 
has the, the mineral mass and we have the chemistry of each each one of these rare earth minerals or even other other minerals in, in other cases could be, for example, arsenic in between a sinopyrite and, and tetrahydrite and antite and other minerals and so on. But the application is the same. You know the mineral mass, you know the chemistry. You can calculate um, the distribution of, um, of uh, any element. I show here rare earths because they're particular um, uh, particularly difficult to tackle and sometimes we think that we know what 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 the case is and and we don't for example we know that uh, zircon in this case contains quite, quite a quite a bit of rare earths and you cannot reject it this zircon is valuable so it cannot really go into the tailings so um i wanted to sort of uh, just to wrap up here um, i know i don't i don't have much uh, much time you know with uh, in this presentation but this is just a highlight of what we do and what we can uh, how we can apply our data uh, one thing that i i like i really like to mention is that today with with automated mineralogy we can we can tackle a number of things so the variability of the samples the liberation of certain minerals um, we and, and apply it to uh, to exploration, geology, and mineral processing. One thing that we forget sometimes um, is that we don't really ex process or look at elements and metals all the time, but we're dealing with uh, with minerals. So it's so critical to understand the mineralogy because mineralogy essentially dictates um, the the. Um, uh, the mineral processing, the, the the ability of the mineral processors to um, recover these minerals and make a product out of it. So we can have high grades, high tonnage, and beautiful ores on on paper and geochemistry, but unless we can prove um, as a first phase using mineralogy that this ore is economic and we can extract these metals. The, the ore has no value as long as it stays in the ground. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks very much for your attention and maybe we'll uh, speak uh, very soon in, in the near future. Bye everybody.